All right, welcome one and all. Um, happy holiday weekend to you all. Happy belated Thanksgiving to you all. I hope um, you saved some holiday leftovers, uh, turkey stuffing, um, gravy and the like uh, for your sherry today because um, sherry both in color and flavor profile uh, is, you know, a wonderful uh, match for the Thanksgiving table. You know, you have like every shade of, uh, you know, beige, amber, and brown represented here um, to match all the beige, amber, and brown cuisine on uh, the Thanksgiving table. Um, at any rate, uh, it's a wine that is equally refreshing and food friendly. And at this point in the eating and drinking marathon that is the long Thanksgiving weekend, it is nice to have something that is uh, equally revitalizing um, and is a happy match um, for all the food uh, that you still uh, have left in your refrigerator. Um, first and foremost, wanna thank uh, Chantal Seng uh, for, for joining us. Uh, say hello to the people, Chantal. Hi, people. How is everybody doing today? I'm really excited to be here to sip sherry, chat sherry, and toast y'all. Awesome. Um, so Chantal is one of uh, the country's foremost experts on sherry. Um, she is the U.S. ambassador uh, for uh, Sherry Week. Uh, she is a proper book, bookworm um, in the best possible sense. Um, loves kind of teasing uh, out um, the, you know, kind of wildly obscure literary uh, connections uh, for the sake of cocktails and wine and uh, fortified beverages like sherry. And uh, she also um, is curating um, really um, kind of unique um, uh, individual cocktail experiences uh, for people through um, her website at Custom Cocktails for uh, the End Times. Um, and uh, she makes a killer uh, drink uh, in addition to um, spinning a fabulous yarn uh, about the sherries that we are about to drink today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Chantel. Um, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, my co-host, uh, Zoe Nystrom. Say hello to the people, Zoe. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, this is Zoe's last uh, Sunday with us on the payroll. Um, she um, is going to continue to haunt um, uh, Tail Up Goat Wine School uh, from henceforth, um, but uh, this is the last week she's getting paid to do so, at least paid, um, you know, uh, through her bank account, you know, we will continue to pay her um, in other ways, uh, hopefully. Uh, but uh, it's been an honor, uh, Zoe, uh, we're going to miss the hell out of you. Um, we've been selling a couple of flights for the occasion this week. Um, the first one, Sherry 101, um, you know, kind of uh, really embodies uh, the three kind of most um, prevalent uh, styles. Uh, sherry comes in many shapes and sizes. Um, that's one of the great joys of Sherry. And uh, we have three of the most famous archetypes here um, in Fino, uh, represented by Manzanilla, um, Amontillado, um, and uh, Oloroso. Um, and we're going to start with those. And we're going to kind of really uh, treat this as a, a guided tasting. And we're going to start with tasting notes on each of these individual wines um, and try to come to a deeper understanding of why the wines uh, taste the way they do, you know, working uh, backwards uh, from, you know, what's uh, in the glass. Because, you know, that gives you a chance to uh, drink uh, more readily, um, not that you need an excuse at home. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that backward um, kind of mode is just a more, you know, enjoyable way to structure class. So uh, we're going to work from the glass uh, back to uh, the bodega, um, as it were. Um, for the sake of the wines themselves, uh, you know, what glass should be serving these in, you know, what temperature, um, you know, traditionally in, in Spain, they give you a copita, um, which is, you know, ita, the diminutive, so it's just a little glass, and, you know, you throw it back and fill it up again, so you wouldn't, you know, um, you know, be throwing sherry into a, a larger wine glass, but, you know, the, um, you know, more rigorous, um, you know, kind of producers in the region, certainly they, they throw their wines into wine glasses. Chantel, what are you drinking out of uh, at the moment? I'm drinking out of uh, still standard white wine glass. And, uh, yeah, yeah, so that's what, that's what I have uh, as well. And, you know, I, I will say I am not one to better size wine glasses. You know, I would be happy to drink out of this singular glass um, you know, in perpetuity, um, it's a great glass um, for, for all wines. Um, you know, uh, a wine like Manzanilla um, is currently in my glass. We'll open up a little more in a glass like this. 
than it would in a traditional copita, but it's better for it. As for serving temp, you can think about manzanillas as you know the lighter fino sherries, lighter in color, it's kind of the white wines of the sherry world. Um, serve them accordingly, closer to you know 45, 50 degrees uh, in temp, and then the darker styles, more oxidative styles, closer to the red wines. Although you know typically you'd serve them closer to like the 55. Um, degree uh, cellar temp, but as the wines get more unctuous and darker in color, typically you can come up uh, in temp uh, as well. Um, so kind of that's uh, the lay of the land uh, just to kick things off. Um, we've got um, a strong uh, contingent of folks. Uh, welcome to you all. Happy belated uh, Thanksgiving. Going to kick things off um, with a bit of verse as we are wont to do. Um, Sherry has all sorts of really proud uh, literary associations, one of my favorite things about it. Um, and uh, the British, the English are huge uh, sherry uh, celebrants. Um, they were uh, deeply involved in uh, making sherry what it is today, uh, deeply involved in uh, the trade of uh, wine in the region, deeply involved in the consumption of wine from the region. Um, and so, um, you know, kind of deeply enmeshed is sherry in their literary culture that um, the British poet laureate, um, from 1619 on uh, was paid with a full butt of sherry, uh, but uh, being a 600 liter uh, traditional vessel um, crafted from uh, neutral American oak, um, contains 720 bottles. So it's good to be the British Poet Laureate. Um, uh, this comes from a, uh, a Poet Laureate, uh, the 22nd, uh, Carol Ann Duffy. She's not the current Poet Laureate. She's the first woman um, to hold the position uh, the first uh, LGBTQ person uh, to uh, hold uh, the position. She's one of my favorite poets. Um, uh, she calls this Ahere. Who wouldn't feel favored at the end of a week's labor to receive as part wages a pale wine that puts the mouth in mind of the sea and not gladly be kissed by gentle William Shakespeare's lips, the dark raisiny taste of his song bequeathed to his thousand daughters and sons, the stolen wines of the Spanish sun, or walk the cool bodegas aisles where flora and oxygen grow talented in fragrances and flavors to sniff, sip, spit, swallow, savor. Um, what a lovely um, bit of verse um, from, uh, from Carol. Um, you know, hugely evocative and, uh, you know, I think really uh, encapsulates, you know, the freshness of this particular style. So um, the uh, poet laureate um, gets to choose um, their uh, butt of uh, Sherry uh, for the sake of payment. And uh, this is Carol Ann uh, with her selected butt of Manzanilla. Um, pretty badass, I think. Uh, anytime uh, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II signs off on anything, but particularly a barrel of wine. Um, any of you looking for gift ideas for wine school, look no further um, at any rate. Um, Without further ado, uh, let's consider uh, the wine itself. And uh, we're gonna let, uh, try to let um, Chantel drive the book of the lesson because um, she is uh, the esteemed and uh, noted uh, expert uh, on the subject. But um, I get to bloviate for a hot second uh, before that happens. Uh, so uh, we're gonna kick it here um, with a crash course um, in uh, Sherry uh, history um, because uh, you know, I think it's important to understand the place before you can understand the wine. Uh, the um, term uh, itself, sherry, um, is actually an anglicization of um, the place name Jerez. So at its bare essence, um, sherry is wine from Jerez. Um, now, uh, the, uh, the city Jerez um, is along the uh, kind of southern coast of Spain, uh, is just inland from Cadiz. Cadiz was uh, historically the port of disembarkation for uh, the Spanish Armada, for uh, the various fleets um, departing from Spain and exploring uh, the New World. So it's wrapped up in the age of exploration um, and uh, in you know really the uh, beginning of the history of modern uh, Europe as we know it. But um, that place name Jerez is actually itself uh, derived from uh, the Moorish name Cheris. Um, and uh, it should be noted that this corner of Spain bears a deep imprint of um, its uh, Islamic, um, you know, uh, originally occupation beginning in uh, 700, lapsed into four centuries of Moorish rule under various caliphates. Uh, the Spanish language um, is uh, at least a quarter uh, derived from um, Arabic. 
um, any word that starts with al, such as alcohol, um, is itself uh, derived from Arabic. So huge imprint. Now um, you're thinking to yourself, you know, um, Arabic, Islam, these uh, seem to be at odds with you know this notion of wine drinking. Um, it should be said that much of the classical Andalusian poetry of the era, which is absolutely gorgeous, one of my favorite schools of poetry, is devoted to the appreciation of love and wine. Um, so, you know, at this time, um, you know, your average, um, you know, kind of uh, Moorish uh, uh, prince um, was very much enjoying wine. And uh, there has been wine made here um, for the better part of, you know, 3,000 years. Um, began with the Phoenicians in uh, 1100 BCE. The region passed from the Phoenicians to the Carthag uh, Carthaginians, to the Romans, to the Vandals. Um, the region itself, Andalusia, takes its name from the Vandals, drop the B, you get the land of the Andals, Andalusia. Um, they list a little bit in that part of Spain, and it should be said that it has its very own um, distinct uh, culture, um, separate and distinct from uh, the rest of the country. Um, I said that the wine itself, Sherry, is, you know, in its most literal sense, a uh, wine from uh, this corner of the world. Legally, sherry cannot come uh, from uh, anywhere else. You can make wine in the style of sherry, uh, but wine legally designated as uh, sherry cannot come uh, from anywhere else uh, but this corner of the world. But um, this corner of the world even more closely demarcated um, and uh, typically only includes uh, the sherry triangle. So uh, if we zoom in, um, for the sake of this larger region, um, you get a, a smaller uh, area, and uh, that is defined by three um, kind of major centers of the sherry trade. Uh, Jerez, which we mentioned, which is the namesake of sherry. Um, also, San Lucar de Merameda, um, on the banks of the Guadalquivir River, and El Puerto de Santa Maria, um, and you're thinking Santa Maria. Yes, that Santa Maria, like uh, the vessel, um, one of the three that Columbus set sail um, to the New World with. And uh, it should be said that um, El Puerto has a fascinating link to American history. Uh, Columbus had a via there. Um, uh, Santa Maria uh, was uh, the place where the first map of the Americas uh, was drawn out. Um, Sherry as a wine doesn't really uh, come of age until the age of exploration, uh, beginning in the 15th and then into the 16th century. Um, and it becomes hugely fashionable in England. Uh, it begins to have spirit added to it. Um, so uh, they take a wine that comes off the vineyards at 11, 12% alcohol. They add a bit of fortifying spirit. Um, and uh, that raises the alcohol uh, to 14, 15, 18% and above. Um, and that is chiefly to protect it um, to make it more durable on transoceanic voyages. It becomes so popular that by 1548, um, there are over 60,000 barrels being produced in this uh, kind of uh, point of origin. Uh, it's estimated that 40,000 of those were designated for export, the bulk majority going to England. Um, you know, that's kind of an abstract number, but just so you get a better sense, that translates to 26 million 750 milliliter bottles. So um, sherry is a huge uh, commodity um, you, as early as the middle of the 16th uh, century. And its fortunes wax and wane uh, for the next several centuries thereafter. Um, the greatest bodegas trace their roots to the tail end of the 19th century. Um, uh, the English are its foremost um, really celebrants. Um, we, the American colonies, and then the uh, kind of nation of the United States inherit uh, the English love of sherry and we adapt it to our own ends through cocktail culture. Um, the first um, cult cocktail, the sherry cobbler, um, uh, really takes sherry um, and adds citrus and sugar and makes it into something that um, really um, kind of captivates uh, both the American imagination and then um, you know, the British um, and continental European imagination from there. So sherry is you know, both a wine to be enjoyed as itself and this wonderful, uh, versatile uh, product that is used to multiple ends um, when we come to the turn of the 20th century. Uh, sadly, phylloxera, prohibition, war worlds intervene. Sherry really has a rough go of it in the 20th century, but uh, it is re-emerging and surging um, into the 20th. Um, what then are we dealing with? 
Um, before we get to Chantel, I just wanted to, um, you know, deliver one more quote. Um, this is from Talia uh, Bayoki's book, and I'm sure I'm butchering her name, but she uh, wrote really for me, um, you know, one of the best modern tomes about Sherry, it's called The Modern Guide, Sherry. Um, and uh, she, uh, you know, uh, starts with this notion of the three elements of Sherry production that set it apart. The first is uh, the Solera system, a method of gradually blending new wines with older wines so that uh, ultimately each bottle is a mixture of many vintages. The second element is floor, a layer of benign yeast that naturally grows on the surface of the wine, uh, protects it from oxidation, um, and you know, ultimately uh, gives rise uh, to this myriad of styles um, and uh, is called biological aging. Uh, and then third is a unique relationship between the terroir of the vineyard, the interplay of the soil, the climate, and the grape varietal, and the terroir of the physical structure where the wine is aged. Um, so, you know, there's this notion of terroir with sherry that we talk about very often in class that is, you know, this imprint that the land has on the grapes, that the grapes then reveal in the wine. There's a second imprint in sherry because the wine is aged in bodega and there's a terroir of the bodega itself. Um, one of the notion, one of the kind of foremost producers in the region uh, says that the life of sherry begins where the life of other wine ends. Um, and, you know, therefore you have this dual imprint. You have this imprint of place as such and a set of chalky soils in southern Andalusia, white grapes grown on white ground. Um, and then you have the imprint of the hand of man in the cellar and this um, years long either biological aging process under floor or oxidation aging process without it, which gives rise to a myriad of styles that we are going to celebrate uh, henceforth. So uh, without further ado, um, uh, we got to 417. I'm sorry, uh, Chantel, I took a little longer than I, I should have there, but um, want to circle back to you. Hopefully everyone's eyes aren't glossing over and we can taste some wine. Um, Chantel, how did you get into um, Sherry uh, in the first place? What captured your imagination? Thank you, Bill. That was amazing. I feel like that was just, I hope everyone absorbed everything you said. It was beautifully researched. It was delightful. Um, how did I get into Sherry? I got into Sherry because I got into working at restaurants and bars and I became a bartender and found Sherry on my back bar. And not knowing much about it, I tried it a few times and had mixed feelings. And then I tried them in cocktails. And then the cocktail, the Adonis, came and I loved it so much. And I'm not sure if you can still hear me. I may have lost everybody. Let me know. <laughs> um, Did I cut out at all? You're cutting in and out a bit, but we can hear you loud and clear. So, yeah. Okay, sorry about that. That does sometimes happen. I apologize. Um, so, uh, the Adonis cocktail is kind of my real gateway to loving sherry. And what's, and what's I, in an Adonis, Chantal? I like to, well, the Adonis and the bamboo cocktail are these classic cocktails that came from, you know, late 1800s that were in that beautiful time period of the golden age of classic cocktails and before prohibition and all that. And I always liken the Adonis to a sherry Manhattan versus the bamboo is more like a sherry martini um, because of the usage of the uh, sweet vermouth and the dry vermouth respectively. Um, and you can make an Adonis with the dry sherry like uh, I used Amontillado, my first, my first um, version of the Amontillado uh, of the Adonis was with the Lucellos Arcos Amontillado, which you have in your flight today. Um, a lot of recipes online will call for even drier, and that has definitely been a trend that's happened over the last 10 years where people were making the Adonis typically, like I know Adam Bernbach loves using an Oloroso, and then they kind of shifted to going to use Fino, so using like a Fino, which is drier and more crisp with the sweet vermouth and the bitters and stirred. But um, I it all tastes delicious. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna knock any of these versions. I just. I learned it as a as a richer, like akin, like the uh, sherry being closer to like an oxidative style, thinking more like a, like a bourbon or a rye, but instead you're using sherry and it's a lower alcoholic version. I usually make mine with Amontillado, um, which is why we named this guy. This little kitty over here. His name is Monty, which is Amontillado. But oh, nice. Yeah. He just likes to be on the screen. It's fine. I didn't call him or anything. But yeah, so that's kind of my gateway. And then my taste just kept getting drier and drier. And I do prefer just a good Fino or a 
Ah, yes, thank you. A good Fino or a Manzanilla and one of the Unramas as well. I happen to have the Valdespino Manzanilla Deliciosa Unrama. That has been my go-to for the last few months. It's been, it's going to be really hard to find in stock for a little while, but they do carry it over at Irving Wine for until it's gone. Uh, brilliant. So um, have you been to uh, the Sherry region, uh, Chantal? Yes, I've been very fortunate to have visited the Sherry region three times um, for three different reasons. The last time was uh, was when I became a certified Sherry educator through, they have a program they do in the uh, fall and the spring. Uh, the fall is in English and the spring is in Spanish. I don't speak Spanish, so I went for the fall. And before, and then um, before that, I a few different times I got to travel and visit many of the bodegas, including including Laguita, Lustau, El Maestro Sierra that you have there. Um, also Hidalgo La Gitana, La Sierra Cigarrera, which is what I'm enjoying right now in my glass, and a few others. So yeah, I highly recommend if anyone does find themselves traveling that way in the in the future that is no longer pandemic sorted, uh, then let feel free to reach out. I might be able to give you some recommendations or some uh, people that could you could talk to. And do you find it's an easy region to travel in just in terms of, you know, their openness to, you know, sherry lovers? Oh, it is beautiful. It is wonderful. Then like when you travel down to Jerez, it's, people take care of you. They're so excited that you made the trip down there. Because if you travel to Spain in general, it's really unlikely unless you make a specific detour and head all the way down south. People often go, okay, let's check out Barcelona, Madrid, maybe they'll make it to Sevilla. But you have to make us you have to like drive down or fly down it's not super easy unless you say i'm going to share your country and so you have to like make that decision and when you do people are very happy that you're there it's it's really amazing i can't talk about that enough <laughs> and i think there's something you know there's this southern i've not been there but you know it reminds me a bit of sicily in the sense that there's this very southern mediterranean you know kind of modality where you know life slows down you know people nurse a, a 500 milliliter bottle of Manzanilla over lunch. And if you're sitting down, you're not gonna sit down for 15 minutes. You know, sitting down is a commitment to an hour long lunch, is a commitment to, you know, just spending time, you know, with food and wine and your company. And there's this wonderful kind of unhurried uh, quality uh, to life in those corners of the world, which I find, you know, initially kind of hard to sometimes warm up to, you know, uh, as hardwired as we are to, you know, the frenetic pace of life um, on this coast. But, you know, once you, you know, get in that mode, I think is really seductive and alluring. Oh yeah, for sure. And what's unique too is um, you mentioned before, there's this, the Sherry Triangle, right? So you have Sherry Country and it's based out of these three different towns, the largest being Jerez, Jerez de la Frontera. Um, the, there's the port town, El Puerto de Santeria, and then there's the beach town, San Lucar de Barrameda. And they do each have their own personalities. And the specific contrast you'll see too is from San Lucar de Barmeda, which is a furthest north, and it's like the one that's basically there's beaches. It opens up to the to the very beginning of the the Guadalquivir River, which is huge and just giant, and it's it's a beach town. And versus you go inland to Jerez, and it's it's just more you're going to have more people wearing suits in Jerez, and in San Lucar you have you have more gypsies like showing up at your bodegas, singing a tune, and then running off with your money, which, you know, doesn't sound great, but, you know, it's all good fun. They, um, it's just a different culture. There's just such a different vibe in the, the two different towns. And if you travel around with some of the Sherry people, they'll, they'll talk about that a lot, and it's, it's pretty funny. I wish I spoke Spanish. I know I missed out on so much because I don't, which makes me sad sometimes, but I'm terrible with languages. Um, yeah, I love this quote. So this is from uh, Talia again um, about San Lucar. And it's fitting that you're talking about that because we're going to start with uh, a Manzanilla sherry. And um, Manzanilla is a type of Fino sherry, uh, specifically from uh, San Lucar de Bermeda. And uh, Talia is talking about the residents of San Lucar. They call themselves uh, San Luqueños. She says, identifying as a San Luqueño, whether or not one even lives there, refers partly to this particular talent for relaxation, but it's also something deeper, something that has to do with the town's subtly rebellious bent, a revolutionary spirit stifled by economic despair, but not stamped out. Uh, while there's always been bodegas there that match uh, Jerez in grandeur and scale, San Lucar has historically been a cottage industry in comparison, a city whose wine business has always been run by many, um, as opposed to a noble fuse. So it's a kind of a more democratic, um, egalitarian uh, kind of place. Um, and uh, let's uh, taste here. 
uh, for the sake of our first offering um, and our first wine. So uh, Zoe, we're gonna give it over to you um, for tasting notes on this first one. This comes from La Guita, and that is not the name of the bodega, it should be said. That's a, a bit of um, a, a nickname. Uh, the estate itself is actually owned by Val Espino, um, uh, but the full name of the bodega is Hijos de Raniera uh, Perez Marin. Um, but uh, that's a bit of a mouthful. So they just go with La Guita, um, which means the string. Um, you can see there's a string on the label. It's part of the brand. Um, La Guita refers to a guitar string and it's basically slang for cash. Um, and uh, supposedly the founder um, of this particular bodega, uh, it dates, it traces its origins to 1852, um, was something of a raconteur and a gambler. Um, and uh, his uh, kind of major product, um, this particular type of sherry uh, became synonymous um, with his, um, I guess, gambling, uh, you know, for lack of a better association. Um, and uh, we're all the better for it. Um, so, um, you know, uh, we can see this in the glass. It is, you know, um, crystal clear. Uh, maybe pale, uh, you know, yellow um, at best. What do you taste? Um, you can totally tell that it's from San Lucar de Barrameda. Like the sea salt is right in your face. Um, after salt and after that like gorgeous ocean breeze, um, I'm gonna second some of the orchard fruit um, notes that people are putting into the chat right now. I'm a pear and like yellow apple. Um, it also has this like, I don't know, like stony steely minerality to it. Um, and then I was kind of surprised that it had um, a bit of like, almost like bready uh, notes on the finish to it. Which yeah, there's something really really about it get into. Uh, on, the, on the back end. Um, so um, we traced uh, the Sherry's origin uh, to San Lucar, uh, the rebellious beach town. Um, how does this wine begin its life in the vineyard, uh, Chantel? I'm gonna pull up. Uh, a picture of these strikingly chalky uh, vineyards here. Yeah, you're looking at all the Albariza soils, which um, is just super white chalky soils. And in fact, it's it's sort of the southernmost part of that that huge shelf that begins all the way north at the cliffs of Dover, that goes through Chablis and like those Camargian soils and all that limestone chalkiness. It ends right here and like down in Jerez and this is just all this chalky soil which is what makes the grape growing and the vineyards so so ideal with the conditions um it's just it retains so much moisture because as you can imagine southern Spain is pretty hot and dry <laughs> and you're also right next to the ocean so there are there's a cool westerly wind that comes in and uh adds some moisture to the air but it's just a great way for the soil that limestone will do different things in different re wine regions around the world but here it it kind of like traps the rain when it's the rainy season, which um, is more in the spring and give, creates little reservoirs so that the vines can go really deep down in the soil and have water even when it's super hot and dry out. But this is so key, the Albariza soil, Alba means white. Um, so you, that's easy to remember because <laughs> it's such a chalky white soil. Um, and what grapes are we dealing with here, Chantal? Here you're probably just looking at Palomino. Um, there are three different grape varietals for what could be classified as sherry, but the mainstay for all of the dry sherry styles is Palomino, also known as Palomino Fino. And uh, it's just a really lovely white grape varietal. All sherry is white grapes. And it has sort of like this, not a ton of acidity, not a ton of, it, it's just a very mild and pretty grape that just excels in this sort of environment in this sort of soil. Brilliant. And, um, you know, for the sake of this wine, uh, the average age is four and a half years. And, you know, we've talked a lot about, you know, kind of evaluating wines as they age and uh, white wines taking on a more golden hue. You know, this has a little bit of that golden aspect to it, but it is, um, you know, mostly crystal clear. Um, you know, what protects this particular offering from oxidizing uh, as it ages in the bodega? Oh, you're, you're talking about the floor. I wasn't reading the chat and trying to answer a question. I was listening to you the entire time. Yeah, so you have what you have is this layer of yeast called the floor. Uh, it's just very native to the to the region. And you'll see that this is a barrel turned on the side. And it's like a 600 liter barrel, which is typical, what they call the butts, the sherry botas. And they usually fill it about five, six full because they want that pocket of air at the top because this is a live yeast, right? So it settles, it grows on the wine. It naturally just happens because 
if you think about it, you leave a piece of fresh fruit out, it, things happen, things grow, right? You create the right conditions and things grow. Uh, but this is, is a live, um, live thing. So you can kind of see it sits on top because it needs air to breathe. So you have air on top to bring all that, but it blankets the rest of the wine so that no oxygen gets below it which is why the Fino and Manzanillas that you're tasting to begin with are going to be considered non-oxidative wines. They're biologically aged, meaning under a live yeast called Flor. Yeah, so if this was a Telestrator, we would circle the yeast and that's your biology. You know, that is the biology and the biological uh, aging right there. And, you know, it looks pretty biological. Um, that is actually several strains of the Saccharomyces yeast. Um, you know, the same set of yeasts that transforms um, sugar into alcohol. Um, you know, during the initial fermentation process. And it requires these very specific conditions um, in which to thrive in the headspace of these barrels and the bodegas. So um, in the bodegas themselves, you know, it, it seems like happenstance, but over the centuries, um, they have really perfected uh, the art of uh, cultivating, um, you know, uh, this kind of, um, you know, kind of layer um, of, uh, of floor. Um, and the conditions are, uh, high humidity, so between 70 and 75 uh, degrees uh, of humidity um, in uh, the bodegas themselves, and uh, pretty moderate temperatures, so somewhere between 64 and 68 degrees um, Fahrenheit. Now that is problematic, especially in the summer, because you're in a hugely arid, extremely hot uh, region. So um, the uh, growers, the uh, producers of the region had to kind of establish these very specialized conditions um, to cultivate, you know, these wines um, in this mode. And uh, they did so um, using these like really gorgeous cathedral-like buildings that evolved and really reached their apotheosis kind of toward the tail end of um, the 19th century. And this is Lustau's. Um, you see these high ceilings and this is called a cathedral style. And there's this religiosity um, to um, these structures. Um, and um, the, actually the most hallowed kind of, um, you know, kind of, uh, parts of these larger buildings are actually called the sacristia, which means a sacristy, which in a cathedral is the most hallowed, um, you know, part of, um, you know, the, the cathedral, um, you know, where, you know, the, the wafer and the wine um, are, are ultimately stored. So um, it seems very Southern Spanish, you know, there's this like high religiosity, um, you know, uh, about uh, the region um, as well, um, I find. But um, the uh, kind of uh, base of the floor you see there is this kind of um, coarse sand called albero, um, and it is constantly refreshed um, with water to uh, both lower the temp and uh, ensure higher humidity. Um, what windows there are here typically are, are higher. Um, they're uh, east or west facing to ensure proper airflow. Um, so they've arrived at this architecture that supports the set of conditions they need to ensure the growth of this um, you know, kind of magical um, yeasty film uh, that makes these wines uh, what they are. And uh, that's a great segue into our second, which is a style called Amontillado. Amontillado begins its life as a Fino sherry. And this particular one we're drinking spends four years as Fino, but then uh, they raise uh, the uh, level of alcohol in it. So they add additional spirits. So typically um, Fino sherry um, ages at somewhere between 14, 15, uh, percent alcohol, but once you raise the alcohol to 17, 18, uh, you create suboptimal conditions for the floor. It dies off and you get something that does not have that protective growth and ages more oxidatively. Um, and so this one from Lustau, uh, whose cathedral-like bodega you just saw there, um, is aging oxidatively for an additional four years after that initial four years of oxidative aging. Uh, Zoe, um, what do you get on the nose for the sake of this one? Um, I thought this had much more butterscotch and caramel notes, much more warm. Um, in terms of fruit, instead of it being like orchard fruit, I thought this uh, jumped into more of the stone families and yellow plums. Um, I thought that it was also like soured citrus in um, uh, as well. And that like that sour quality really comes through with that like, you know, raging acid, but also that tartness that I love. Um, and there was still like a little bit of uh, nuttiness that I, um, I really enjoy. This is more like a I don't know, maybe more almond skin as opposed to like a praline. Um, Chantel, what do you love about Amontillado? You know, drinking on its own and working with cocktails. You referenced your cat, Monty. So clearly it is a wine uh, that you love. 
it is the it is the sherry that first stole my heart in sherry uh, but yeah it's it's so beautifully complex because you have what in it's the one category in sherry that gives you a little bit of both worlds it gives you yes part of its life spent under yeast and on the floor developing those really cool toasty bready acetylhyde ick notes i'm using the wrong adjective but and all that complexity that you get from being a little bit more savory and you get that and then it also spends time in the oxidative stage which we haven't tasted yet but then you get that sort of roundness and that richness and more of that spice and the nuttier edges and they kind of they sing and they get married together and they create a whole new style it's it's really unique um so aromatically complex every every swish as you get 300 different things can happen at any given time and it's also i find the most adaptable to food pairing all sherry goes so great with different types of food but amontillado kind of really bridges a lot of gap a lot of um cuisines yeah and i mean <laughs> it, it speaks to my broader love of things that are kind of um you know between genres so you know it, it is you know, a little bit Fino, a little bit Oloroso, you know, a little bit country, a little bit rock and roll. And, you know, it has the elegance of, you know, Fino, but, you know, some of the breadth of an Oloroso. And, you know, that really gives it this wonderful skeleton key quality um, when it comes to, to pairings. I, I find the same thing myself. And, you know, it's a wine that I just enjoy drinking for its own sake, you know, because it is, it is so, you know, both, you know, wonderfully versatile, but wonderfully multifaceted. And I, I think, you know, depending on how you approach it, um, you know, even what kind of mood you're in or what kind of other drink you're coming off of or what type of food you're eating, you know, it reveals a different, you know, facet of its personality in this just like wonderfully dynamic uh, kind of way. Um, which brings us to um, the last kind of um, classical archetype, which is Oloroso. Oloroso means aromatic um, in, in Spanish. Um, and, you know, um, it is kind of like the most effusively aromatic of the bunch. I, I think, you know, kind of fruitcake and dried fruit and, you know, toasted hazelnuts uh, when it comes to uh, the Oloroso style. But you're dealing with a wine that never uh, ages, um, you know, uh, biologically. So uh, the um, cellar master essentially deciding from the outset um, that, you know, this is a wine that is, is destined for this, you know, kind of fuller um, expression and uh, at the outset, you know, adding more alcohol to the wine so that it has no chance uh, to develop that more delicate floor. And, um, you know, uh, they are kind of working, um, you know, with different uh, vineyards. And over time, they've realized that, you know, certain vineyards gives wines that are more delicate and better suited for Fino or Montania and other vineyards, other soil types even give wines that are better suited for this, you know, uh, wine with a little more breadth. And, and sometimes they'll, you know, press a little harder. So typically with, you know, uh, Fino in particular, you're getting um, free run juice or very light pressings. Um, and then with Oloroso, you know, you're getting slightly harder pressings um, for these wines and, and, you know, some of those coarser phenolics, some of those, you know, um, you know, kind of bigger, uh, uh, less delicate uh, flavors. Uh, so uh, this comes from El Maestro Riera, um, three generations strong of uh, uh, females um, in uh, Sherry. Um, you know, there's actually, a, a, there are a lot of kick-ass women making wine throughout Spain, but um, in the South in particular, which historically was a, a little more conservative, um, there aren't quite as many of them, but uh, this particular uh, producer, El Maestro Sierra, um, uh, three generations strong, including Ana uh, Cabrestrero, who is the current uh, Capataz. Capataz is this like mythological um, cellar master um, in, um, you know, the, the Sherry parlance. Uh, so what do you get um, when it comes to this wine, um, you know, on the nose and on the palate? This is so remarkable. I love its richness and then I love how it just finishes so whistle clean. You know, it really does like take the like figs and um, that's like very supple, sweeter texture where you like think it's going to go into a different place and then it makes like a direct like left turn. Um, and then that balanced with the acid, you get like more savory notes as well. Um, like you wrote like beef stock in the tasting notes. I think yeah. that's like absolutely phenomenal. I got that little like mushroom umami thing with like dried leaves and then um, like tea leaves um, and, and other dried fruit. Yeah, I mean, uh, I love Sherry in part two because it's like the MSG of wines. You know, it is the most umami driven wine in the world. It's like the Popeye's Cajun magic. Um, and uh, part of that too is uh, because of the production in, in, in Oloroso Sherry of glycerol. Glycerol is a byproduct of fermentation and creates this perception of weight on your palate. And one of the things Flora does is it strips the wine of glycerol 
Um, but in these wines like Olorosa's that aren't stripped by chlorodiglycerol, they have this almost perceptual sweetness and, and weight. Um, Chantel, what do you like about this particular style? Oh, well, yeah, particularly Almaishu Sierra. I'm such a huge fan of this, um, this bodega and this Oloroso is my go-to. Um, I, I like it because of the weight, because, uh, well, the, first of all, it's hard not to talk about Oloroso in uh, any of these categories without talking about their range, because as you previously tasted the Los Arcos, which is a very full-bodied Amontillado, and the Oloroso here, I wouldn't say is necessarily a full-bodied Oloroso, but it is delightful, and it sings, and it's complexity and length, and you get that that really amazing earthy, mushroomy, umami vibe. You get them from both of these types of styles. And um, what I love so much about it is how it, it has a little bit more weight. It can stand up to different types of meatier dishes, different types of dishes that you might not be able to, like certain things will get lost in. And the same with cocktail ingredients. Um, something very adaptable about sherry. Like you can pair it with something that you would think, would it make sense? Uh, two different dishes and you kind of go well it kind of brings a little bit to both it kind of brings something to tuna it kind of brings something to a pork loin it just kind of does something that you wouldn't necessarily expect and it works well with so many different sweeter or spicier elements in food and sauces which it can be considered non-traditional but it really just depends where you're from i'm I, I very used to sweet and sal saltier type spicier dishes so i've always been very amazed by the sharing pairing capabilities <laughs> sherry pairing capabilities of sherry <laughs> uh, that feels like a great uh segue into one of the great um pairing tropes uh the world over this is actually one of my so i, I universally despise uh hard and fast pairing rules because there are always exceptions and you should you know live in the mystery and you know have fun with the um you know kind of um unexpected um, you know, kind of kismity discoveries that come with just trying a lot of different food with wine. But uh, this one, you know, is just too fun not to uh, perpetuate. So uh, there's a rule when it comes to sherry to say, uh, if it swims, Fino and Montania, if it flies, Amontillado, Palo Portado, if it runs, Oloroso. So um, obviously that only has to do with um, uh, protein. So sadly, um, in Spanish parlance, um, you know, or in Andalusian parlance, I guess there weren't a lot of vegetarians. Um, you know, so maybe there's a separate set of uh, pairing tropes for, for vegetables. Maybe like if it's raw, um, you know, finza mandania, um, you know, if it's, uh, you know, lightly roasted amontillado, if it's, you know, charred or darkly roasted, um, you know, oloroso. But uh, at any rate, um, you know, it, it is, you know, certain truth uh, to this particular set of cliches. And, um, you know, I, I think uh, it is, it is kind of fun to play around with them. And sherry is, you know, Psalms will say this till they're blue in the face, but it is one of the wine world's great values. So we were drinking an Oloroso. Um, the minimum age on that wine coming out of Solera is 15 years, 15 fucking years for something that retails for, you know, typically like under $30 or $30. Um, and, you know, everything is done by hand in that bodega, um, transferring the wine, you know, you, you name it, um, you know, from, from Bota to Bota. Um, you know, it is a, a hugely artisanal product in and of its own right, and it is hugely versatile uh, in terms of the things it goes with. So, you know, when we're constructing, you know, tasting menus, when we're working out pairings, sherry is this, you know, really fabulous, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, paint uh, color uh, to be able to deploy, um, you know, for the sake of your canvas that, you know, um, is wonderfully uh, varied and versatile and, you know, just brings so much to the table. And, and I think people just avoid it, uh, sadly, in, in workaday life. You know, it's not the thing that people ask for. It's not the thing on the tip of their tongue. Um, but I think whenever they get it in the glass, whenever they, you know, are able to approach it in context with the right dish, they're always um, hugely uh, impressed. Um, so are there any questions um, from the lot uh, about any of these wines for Chantel? Um, you name it. Yeah, could you elaborate more on the um, denominations on each barrel and like particularly the striking method with like the Amontillado and Palo Cortados? You mean the symbols, right? Mm -hmm. Did you talk to me or, or, or Bill? I'm sorry. No, it's just for you. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, one of the really cool things, and if you go, to, if you do visit Bodegas Lustau, um, they actually have this really, they have a whole bunch of artwork dedicated to all these like classic symbols. And so, you know, all the white chalk on the dark barrels are, it's just part of their capitaz, their organized organization system of their warehousing of their 
barrels where when they first classify a sherry and they're deciding whether they're going to be it's going to be a fino or a manzanilla and they're going to let it be biologically aged versus if it's going to be an oloroso because that's the first classification they mark it with a single splash right so just like a like one little splash and that's a fino and if they're like oh this is a little bit fuller and it's not as pretty and delicate then they're going to pursue the oloroso so then they just put a circle and that makes it an oloroso and then as you as they're and that's the first classification and then later they're like okay is it going to be continue aging beyond fino because essentially an amontillado is an old fino or a manzanilla well then they then they kind of do this little a thing in there and so it's like a it looks like it almost looks like a one of the um, at symbols but it's not it's a little bit different and it's got a, a splash through it and it's kind of an evolution of the splash and then everything together and its own unique thing um palo cortado it looks more like a cross. And the reason why Palo Cortado looks more like a cross is because even though there's many different ways to talking about Palo Cortado, it really is just a fino because it's a de because the first mosto that they discover is really pretty like it comes from like finos and manzanilla designations. And so they it's a fino that's like a particularly beautiful musk that they, instead of letting it become a full fino, they they decide to take that beautiful musk and pursue oxidatively a sherry which ends up being Palo Cortado. That's generally what happens these days and then so that one's like a slash and a cross and then they have there's other things after that the muscatel and px are different they're like an e thing and then a px and it's that didn't help i know this means nothing My well yeah there's it's like uh it's like dan <laughs> it's like dan brown level um you know kind of uh you know graphic language um yeah. it is a great segue into the two palo cortados that we have it should be said that palo cortado is like personally, one of my favorite styles. Um, uh, and it's for the same reason that Amontillado is one of my favorite styles. Um, and, and the difference between Amontillado and Palo Cortado is hugely murky and hugely unregulated. Um, it's one of the, you know, kind of most common questions I get when I'm teaching this to our staff is, you know, what's the difference between Amontillado and Palo Cortado? Well, stylistically, um, in, in Sherry Country, they would say that, you know, a Palo Cortado is, is richer than um, an Amontillado, but lighter than an Oloroso. Um, but they are kind of cut from the same cloth in the sense that originally, you know, they begin their life uh, aging biologically and then they end it aging oxidatively. That said, there's this huge continuum. So there's some producers that make their Palo Cortado um, like other producers make their Amontillado. Um, and, uh, you know, we drank kind of a broader shouldered um, Amontillado for the sake of the Luz de los Arcos, which is from Jerez. Um, and then the wines of Jerez tend to be, you know, more substantive. It's inland. Uh, they tend to get less of a biological influence. The floor there, um, which depends on humidity, doesn't grow as thickly as it does in San Lucar. And then we have a wine like the Wellington. So the Wellington is a BOS. BOS is a designation in Jerez for wines that um, at a bare minimum are 20 years old. Um, it comes from a Latin phrase, vinum optimum signatum. Um, but in English, they say very old sherry, which just feels much more prosaic. You know, please use the Latin at home. It just sounds way better. Um, but this is uh, Idago La Itana, which is in um, San Lucar. And as such, it begins its life not only as fino, but as, as manzanilla, which is the most delicate of the fino sherry. So you have a palo cortado here that drinks kind of like Amantiao, um and, and has some of that, you know, kind of, uh, you know, kind of uh, delicate, uh, you know, uh, quality. Um, uh, to it. And I was going to ask uh, Zoe for her tasting notes here, but uh, she is attending to other things at the moment. Uh, Chantel, are you familiar with this one? Oh, yeah. Oh, I wish I could drink it all the time. <laughs> um, what, do you, what do you like about uh, the, the Wellington? About the Wellington? Um, it's a really pretty Palo Cortado. It is so honeyed. It is yeah. so honey. It is yeah. all about like the salt caramel and the honey. And it it's just it has this lean leanness to it, right? So it's not rich and fruit cakey like you get from some Lustau and some Williams and Humbert offerings, which are a little bit fuller bodied like that. It is just it is like toffied but soft. And at the same time it finishes dry. And whenever I say finishing dry, something that I, I would love to just bring up real quick is my favorite metaphor for when I talk about the perceived dryness and perceived wheat, sweetness when you get out of sherries, as I call it the um the sour patch effect right the sour patch kid effect where you can smell a glass of sherry and it smells sweet but then when you taste it it actually has like a sour and a dry quality finish to it and these are dry sherries are like this it's kind of the opposite of the sour patch kid where 
you bite into it and it's like sour and then it finishes sweet. So I call it like the reverse sour patch effect often happens because your nose will be fooled. It'll be like, oh my God, that smells like toffee and richness and walnut. And then you taste it and you're like, oh, oh, that's so much not what I was expecting. Because then if you try later a sweeter sherry, then you'll be like, oh no, that's sweet. That's sweet. <laughs> it kind of, it messes. It's like it plays mind tricks. It plays palate tricks on you, but that makes it fun. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and it is, I think, I think for those of us that live in this universe of smell and taste, that's another thing that we love about sherry is the way that, you know, it kind of conflates those expectations of what you think something is when you kind of initially approach it on the nose and then subsequently appreciate it, um, you know, on the palate. And, you know, people find this whole journey. So, you know, we taste it in Amontillado that, you know, honestly tastes, I think the Los Arcos tastes like a more substantive wine than the Wellington. Um, uh, you know, and, and so what gives there, but, you know, I think, and that feels very Spanish because it's not something they're invested in, you know, uh, really codifying or regulating, you know, it just is what it is. And, and you know, we live in the mystery of it all, um, you know, but, you know, that fluidness is, is really pretty and, and like fun uh, to, you know, kind of uh, tease apart. And, and so the other Palo Cortado we have here um, is actually higher in alcohol than the Oloroso uh, that we shared. So this is at 21% alcohol, um, and in this corner of the world, um, magically in um, Solera, the wines get higher in alcohol. That, that doesn't happen inland. So um, we have uh, eventually, uh, we're going to taste the Alvear. And, and for the sake of Pedro Jimenez, as the wines age, they actually lose alcohol. Um, uh, and they tend to be unfortified because it's hotter there and the grapes have more potential alcohol. But um, in the Sherry Triangle, as the wines age, they gain alcohol. And um, it's a great mystery to me. Um, uh, we we spent as a staff the better part of uh, you know weeks and months you know trying to you know tease out the the logic of that. Um, uh, but you know uh, that's for another class, I guess, um, with an actual chemist uh, who can uh, or maybe Chantal can opine um, you know about the uh, you know particular uh, magic of uh, the various um, evaporation rates of alcohol and water. But um, at any rate, um, this is a single amesanista bottling, so. Um, you have these almacenistas throughout the sherry region, and they're basically individual um, stockholders. So they have their own small, um, sh you know, kind of uh, criaderas, or a criadera is like a nursery, um, your own small nursery. And, and very often, larger bottlers will buy from these single nurseries. In this case, you have Caetano de Pino, which itself was a huge brand um, that's fallen on hard times. They actually supplied to the Spanish royal family, and they are um, particularly famous for their Palo Cortados. Um, and in this case, you have a Palo Cortado from Jerez that is, you know, richer and more unctuous um, than uh, something like uh, the Wellington and, you know, has some of the, the depth and the length even of the Oloroso that we tried before. And, you know, for the sake of that Oloroso, it should be said that uh, El Maestro Sierra, you have this imprint, this terroir imprint of their bodega and their bodega is actually at elevation in Jerez which is significant because it gets this cooling influence uh, from that elevation. And um, Lustau's bodega is much closer to the city center. And because of that, you know, um, there's less of a cooling influence there. Um, and, you know, this whole kind of intermixing, intermingling of, you know, that vineyard influence um, and, you know, sherry is a wine of the soil, but then it is a wine of uh, the bodega uh, as well in a hugely fascinating way. Uh, Chantal, are you familiar with the uh, Alma City Sabotling? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's what's so amazing about Lustau in general is that they are the, the one main bodega that really helped introduce the rest of the world to the tradition of the Alma Sinista bottlings because they are just independent wholesale warehousers, essentially. And uh, um, I've had this once and I, I wish I could say I've had it more often than that. So you'll have better tasting notes than I will for this one, just so you know. I am familiar with their more common Palo Cortado. Uh, which in that similar vein to the Los Arcos and also their Oloroso, it has that fuller vibe, very different from the Wellington. Yeah, for me, this is muscular and penetrating. Um, so, um, you know, you get a sense of the fullness of alcohol um, on it, but then, you know, the, the acid is raging. It's just like a little like wit VA to it. It, uh, you know, uh, it is a, a wine that you know, feels every bit as muscular as, you know, um, the most audacious red, um, but then has this, you know, kind of like bright briny um, influence that, you know, you would never expect of a, a standard red wine. And, you know, it, 
leans even more into that like beef bullion, um, you know, terrain. Um, but, you know, it's all base, you know, whereas the Wellington is more delicate and treble, um, you know, and, and so, you know, there's, there's something, you know, um, you know, much more, uh, I, I, I feel like I revert to these gendered tropes too much, but there's just something more masculine uh, about it uh, to me uh, than, than something like the Wellington, which just feels, you know, prettier, um, for lack of a better word, um, you know, and, and more easygoing. Um, you know, the, um, the Caetano is, is just a, a much more substantive wine, you know, and I tend to think, of, you know, in terms of the kinds of things I want to eat them, you know, these wines with, and, you know, I want, you know, I want like a hanger steak with the Cayetano or, you know, the Wellington, you know, seared scallop or something like that, you know, feels like it would be, um, you know, a, a perfect match. So, um, yeah, I, I guess, you know, the difference between surf and turf would be another way um, to encapsulate uh, the two of them. And then uh, lastly, um, you know, for the sake of these flights, because Zoe's gone AWOL on me, um, we have um, this uh, Alvear, and this comes from a different, a different region um, entirely. And I'm gonna pull up a broader map of the region here, uh, Chantal, but, um, you know, I wanna talk about, um, you know, this kind of off the, off the beaten path. So we have the shared triangle um, that we, you know, have, have broached and discussed uh, for the sake of this lesson. And then we have this other region, which is uh, Montilla Mariles. So um, what is it like in, in Montilla and, um, you know, what grape are we dealing with uh, for the sake of this particular wine, Chantal? So yeah, you're further, further inland and you get less of that Poniente influence and more of the Levante and it's drier and you're 100% Pedro Jimenez PX grapes. And it's Montilla Marias, right? So it's not cherry. Um, but funny, amazing relationship with Sherry Country is that like a good 90% of Pedro Jimenez grapes are, they're sourcing it from this region and then aging it in the Sherry Triangle to create PXs, which are Sherry. But Bodegas Alvear uh, is what you're pouring in. I've been there, I've been to a few places, Bodegas and Montilla, and Alvear is brilliant. And they, um, they, they explain to me a lot of really amazing things. And they also have the really cool, uh, I don't know if you know where Tinajas are, but they actually still incorporate the use of Tinajas for like fermenting. And oh, cool. And um, so that is a ceramic uh, aging vessel alert. Those are traditional Spanish and for. Totally. And uh, so 100% Pedro Jimenez grapes. And the Pedro Jimenez grape actually has a lot higher acidity and sugar levels. So you get a natural fermentation, which goes above 15%. There's no fortification. So they don't actually fortify their wines when they're creating um, their PXs. So, well, that's the confusing thing, right? We call it PX, but in, in Montilla, everything is made from PX, but the style, which is also called PX, because they could make a fino, right? There's the Alvear fino. They have a couple different versions, a lighter one from like cocktails, and they have one that's uh, a little bit more meaty, but nothing is fortified. Is what's what's really important there. Yeah, and you know, my favorite thing about this wine is you know the balance of it. Uh, PX is um, a hedonist dessert wine. It, it is you know candied. Um, it, Pedro Jimenez is great that you know takes on sugar um, and ripens readily. Um, in a region in Montilla Mariles that, you know, um, invites ready ripening. But, um, you know, this is a wine that doesn't descend into, you know, obnoxious treacle, you know, cloying, you know, drinking syrup territory. There's something refreshing about it. Uh, Zoe, welcome back. Um, uh, tasting notes on the uh, Palo Cortados and uh, the PX for you, Zoe, take it. Cool, so I'll start with the loose style, the um, Alcaminista. Um, I thought that that was like that perfect balance of like savory with all that veggie plus um, that like Christmas cake spice. Got some more like peachier flavors to it, um, but it was like really like, you know, savory. The uh, texture of it was really nice and opulent and waxy, which I really love. Um, the Wellington Palo Cortado was like just very flamboyant to me. Um, like the quality of the fruit was so soured and it had like a lot of, um, I don't know, like brightered. I have like candied nuts, burnt orange zest, um, but it like, it just has that fruit quality that is so ripe, I think that I wasn't expecting of like, that's why it was just so loud and so unexpected to me. Huh. Um, the LVR is like the most beautiful thing in the whole wide world. Just figgy, pruny, ginger snap cookie. I want it over vanilla ice cream and, or just in a glass or by itself. It's lushly sweet and I don't care. 
Um, Chantal, let's talk pairings. You know, what do you like to pair with, you know, uh, the Pedro Jimenez's of the world? And, you know, what do they, do they pair with them in Spain or do they just drink them alone? Oh, no, they definitely, they do definitely do exactly what you think they would do. They pour it over ice cream, they have it with blue cheeses, um, and and they have it with dessert, chocolate. And that's generally what PX is being paired with in Spain and a lot of places that are drinking it in general. Uh, as far as the other styles are going, you know, um, I mean, I got, I have, I always put a shout out for Amontillado and duck and roast duck. I love that pairing. <laughs> Yeah, and I think I mean the Palo Cortados would do the same thing. You know, the, they they scratch the same itch. Um, yeah. And I actually will I will say that I see your roast duck and I raise you um, uh, Popeyes fried chicken. Uh, I think you know uh, Popeyes and a really good bottle of um, you know Montiado Palo Cortado is just one of life's great joys. Um, and it should be said, you I think sometimes that, you cannot knock Fino and fried chicken though. Oh really? No, I've never, I've never, I've, I've never gone there. I've always just, I've stopped at Amontillado. I need to try fino and fried chicken. <laughs> maybe white meat, maybe more white meat than dark meat for fino, or uh, yeah. 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 Um, you know, but yeah, I, I just, I, just, you know, if you get, if there's one takeaway from this lesson, just, just drink sherry, buy sherry. You know, to the, to the extent that you know, we as consumers exercise, you know. Um, kind of influence uh, for the sake of the invisible hand, you know, the more you buy Sherry, the more people, you know, will offer it. And it is just so underappreciated on, you know, still, um, you know, I, th I think people in the know get tired of people saying that Sherry is underappreciated, but it's still underappreciated. <laughs> it hasn't, you know, it, hasn't, you know, um, you know, it definitely hasn't jumped the shark yet. Um, so, you know, just buy it, just drink it, um, you know, to the extent that you're worried about, you know, pairing with things or, or whatever, you know, just grab a bottle of sherry. You know, the, the, the finos, the manzanillas, they, they are a little more delicate. You know, you should drink them within a few days, within a week, certainly. But the amontillado, the palo cortado, the olorosos, they, they can hang out, you know, for a couple weeks. And they're still fucking delicious. Um, and sometimes they'll improve. Um, you know, sometimes they'll open up. Um, so I, I think, you know, if there's one takeaway, just, just seek it out. Just drink it. Um, Chantal, uh, how are you? Um, so it should be said, Chantal got her beautiful headset from um, our good friends at Lustau. So obviously this is not her first, uh, you know, virtual Sherry lesson, but um, how are you spending uh, pandemic? I'm spending the pandemic with my cat mostly and I'm trying to upkeep my website, which I created back in April in response to being in a pandemic and quarantined. It's uh, cocktailsforendtimes.com and I started writing a blog, which, you know, been always meaning to do that forever. And also I set up a, a really easy form you can fill out that just says, hey, fill out this form. It tells me basically what your inventory at your home looks like. And then I craft cocktails, like custom recipes for people. And uh, I also do classes, right? So people can hook, email me and ask to set up private sherry classes, cocktail classes. And um, it's basically what's been keeping me going throughout the pandemic. And I'm very thankful for everyone who's checked out my website and ordered some cocktails from me. I've also been working with authors uh, and because I, I love reading, which is why we're simpatico here. We're huge book nerds. And I've been working with a few authors. They send me their book and then I create a cocktail based on their book for them and they use it for their own promotional purposes, which is also awesome. And I hope more authors continue to do this and send me more books. <laughs> Uh, and if people are interested, uh, you know, in, you know, reaching out to you about um, a, you know, kind of specially curated cocktail experience, etc., cetera, um, we throw your uh, website into the chat there and uh, we'll certainly follow up with that on our, our recap. Um, and uh, you do, a, so you are the U.S. ambassador uh, for U.S. Sherry Week, which is earliest month. And then uh, you typically celebrate Bloomsday. Did you do Bloomsday uh, this, this year as well? Oh no, Bloomsday was back in the summer and I didn't really have a venue or things oh, okay. quite sorted out at the time. Uh, I wasn't as comfortable to figure something out there. So yeah, yeah. didn't do Bloomsday. I, um, I ce celebrate other things like Aquavit Week and just Sherry every day versus just Sherry Week. Yeah, um, yeah. Every, every week is Sherry Week. Exactly. Um, so, uh, Zoe, we're going to let you run the roost here uh, for the sake of the remainder of class, but I'd be remiss if I didn't see you off 
uh, with a bit of verse. So uh, for those of you not in the know, um, every time uh, we release one of our uh, employees into the wild, um, they get uh, a parting uh, poem. Uh, Zoe has been uh, with us for a good long while, but uh, for the sake of uh, Tail Goat Wine School um, and for the sake of Revelers Hour, um, she is part of our DNA. Uh, we asked her to be part of the opening team. Uh, she has bravely stayed on through pandemic and I have been continually inspired uh, by her spirit of resilience in the face of, you know, both personal and professional uh, turmoil um, and the good cheer that she's uh, brought our way uh, every, every day and I will miss the fuck out of her. Um, so uh, without uh, further ado, uh, a bit of verse uh, uh, to see you out, Zoe. Um, this is from Rita Duff. Uh, Rita was the first um, uh, Black Poet Laureate uh, stateside. Um, she is awesome. Uh, she uh, got Fulbright uh, to study German, uh, translates German poetry, and writes some of uh, my favorite uh, poems, um, you know, in uh, modern era. This is called Testimonial. Uh, back when the earth was new and heaven just a whisper, back when the names of things hadn't had time to stick, back when the smallest breezes melted summer into autumn, when all the poplars quivered sweetly in rank and file, the world called and I answered. Each glance ignited to a gaze. I caught my breath and called that life swooned between spoonfuls of lemon sorbet. I was pirouette and flourish, I was filigree flame. How could I count my blessings when I didn't know their names? Back when everything was still to come, luck leaked out everywhere. I gave my promise to the world and the world followed me here. Uh, Zoe, um, everything is still to come for you. Uh, we wish uh, the world uh, for you to follow you uh, wherever you show your promise. Uh, we will miss you, but you will always uh, have a home uh, virtually uh, and physically uh, at Tail of Goat and Revelers. Uh, we love you, girl. Cheers. Uh, to everyone at home, alone together. Salud. Cheers. Salud. All right, Zoe, we've been neglecting the commenters. Uh, what do you have for us? Chantel's just been killing it and answering a lot of the specific no, questions. No, well. no. Um, Chantel is capable of reading and responding to the chat. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's uh, maybe it comes with a headset. Maybe that's what I need. Maybe if I have a headset, then I'll be able to do both at once. But uh, no, it's all been um, mine to answer that question. <laughs> do you have the? Do you, maybe you have the cat whispering into your ear too. It could be like a uh, a Cheshire thing happening. Exactly. That's true. <laughs> um, did you um, talk about the Vine space? and how uh, far apart they were and how that looked a little unique as opposed to like regular vines that we're used to seeing. And is that indicative of Palomino specifically when from that photo that we saw or um, am I just not in the now? That's a good, that's a good point. Um, so we did not talk about that at all. It's a very astute comment. Um, uh, vine spacing um, is kind of a nerdier topic uh, that we don't typically touch on. That's more of like Levy's domain for the I'll drink to that crowd. Uh, but um, it's, it's worth touching on. So it should be said that by law, sherry is harvested by hand. Um, and uh, that is more um, a Marxist kind of let's give the workers something to do paradigm than it is a um, kind of quality uh, statement. Um, and they're actually, it's harder to get people to harvest by hand than it used to be. Um, it should be said, um, the closer your rows are together, the more they're competing for resources, the lower the yields tend to be on an individual plant. Um, uh, I'm going to share the uh, picture of the vine rows here. Um, these are uh, wire trained. Traditionally, um, in sherry, the vines would have been bush trained. Um, can you speak to uh, vineyard spacing um, in uh, the sherry triangle, Chantel? Well, yeah, I mean, keep in mind that because of the, the hot, hot sun and the terroir that you're at and how the Albrecht's soil does create reservoirs of water and you don't want to have super close vines because you're competing for these little reservoirs and you need that kind of thing spaced out. So it's, it's just speaking to the, the natural conditions needed for that type of hot sun and water way, way below the earth. Um, yeah, and Albrecht's soils are really kind of amazing. Um, uh, limestone soils in general are pretty remarkable. So 
Uh, Albarita, um, you know, scientifically consists of at least 30% um, active limestone. There are certain types, of, they're actually get really, if you want to dive really deep, there are actually subtypes of Albarita, uh, some of which contain up to like 80% worth of active limestone, which is basically, you could write on a blackboard with that. That's just chalk, which is madness. Um, and the cool thing about these soils are that they both shed and retain water. Um, so by uh, volume, they can retain about 25% of their volume um, uh, worth of water um, when they're inundated, um, but they also kind of readily shed it um, in excess of that. So it's just kind of perfect um, environment as such uh, for grape vines. Um, and then they regulate nutrient exchange in a way that um, ensures the health of the vines and also ensures high acid um, in the resultant wines, which is hugely important um, in Southern Spain because you know, the natural inclination this far south, this close to the equator, would be for flabby, um, you know, unremarkable, you know, kind of wines. And, and the chalk, the alvaritha, you know, uh, allows for, you know, these zippy, you know, high acid wines. It should be said, they also cheat um, in, in sherry. So uh, traditionally, and into the modern era, traditionally, they would have added gypsum to the grape must. Uh, uh, typically, straight off the vine, they add tartaric acid. So um, sherry is not, broadly speaking, a natural wine. Everybody freak out, you know, oh, um, whoa, wow, they're adding tartaric, everybody freak out. Um, but it just isn't. They, they add acid to it. They do, almost universally. Um, I feel like, you know, pretty much everything we drink or we've had today has had tartaric acid to it, like, with the exception of the Pedro Menace, because it doesn't need it. But like, it just is, it works, get over it. Um, you know, um, there was actually the original natural, one of the original natural wine health scares was in the late uh, 19th century when the English promulgated this notion that adding gypsum to wine was unhealthy, um, which it wasn't. Um, but, you know, this notion of naturalness in wine is ages old um, and, you know, has been alive and well in cherry um, for a long ass time. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, they, they, you know, adulterate it. And, and again, you're dealing with something that like, Cherry is like this really cool intersection of nature and nurture. Like it wouldn't exist without both imprints and it needs both things. What else you guys have? Um, did you touch upon how alcohol um, ABV uh, depends on style and oh, health characteristics um, as well? Yeah, like obliquely. Um, uh, uh, Chantal, you want to talk about that just in terms of, so um, we make, so like in the life of a sherry, um, we make a base wine. So typically a uh, Palomino comes off the vineyards at potential, at pretty low potential alcohols. So potential alcohol just refers to the amount of sugar in the grapes. So when they come off the vineyard, um, if you vinify, if you, if you, you know, um, fully uh, ferment um, the available sugar in the wines, they can make alcohol up to a certain percentage. And Palomino comes off the vine at a relatively low percentage uh, uh, historically, um, you know, somewhere between 12 and, and 13%. Um, what then do they do when they're making Fino versus Oloroso, Chantal? So well, it's like that first classification. So the, right. So actually right about now is usually, although the harvest was super early this year, like I think it was in July, it was quite wow. early. That's mad. Yeah. It's never, it's never been that early before, but um, typically at the end of November, typically now is when the, the fermentation, just like the must, is basically done and they're about to make their first classification where they decide if something's going to be pursued as a fino or something's going to be pursued as an oloroso. So they're always deciding if they're going fino or oloroso, and then after that, they figure out what happens. Kind of like, then we go, does the fino become an amontillado or does it just become fino? Does the, uh, the fino become a palo cortado? Does the oloroso become something we want to keep adding and age further? And do we want to take this oloroso and blend it with a style of sherry to make it sweeter, blend it with PX and create a medium or a cream? And so the first initial thing is fino or oloroso. And if it's fino, then they fortify with that neutral grape spirit to 15%. And if it's oloroso, they fortify to 17% because at 17%, floor will not live, but at 15%, floor will still thrive, but no other things will live because that's why it was called floor the beast yeast. But in terms of alcohol, we're asking about what happens to alcohol over time. There's a few different scenarios depending on the style. So 
Fino, the yeast, lives on top of the wine and it's eating the sugar out of the wine, which is why you get such a dry wine with a final product of less than a gram of sugar per liter. But it's also eating alcohol. So Fino, this beast yeast, as like I'm sorry, Floor, the beast yeast I like to call, is feeding off the sugar, but also the alcohol. So over time, the alcohol and sugar levels are going down. And now you have to, that's, that's the little sword there, right? You have to make sure you fortify to keep to keep the wine at 15%, because if it gets less than 15%, other things could grow. Other things that won't make sherry taste or smell nice. So you have to actually constantly monitor it and fortify it back to 15% so that it continues to go. Now, if you have an older oxidatively aged sherry um, aging in their casks, and over time, like you're thinking about those VOSs, VORSs, and the age statements, those, the, no, you're no longer living underneath an eight, a floor, yeah. or maybe you never were, but um, the opposite of angel share happens. I mentioned this in the comments, um, where just to, what's up? That's an old one. Thanks for that. Okay. The, uh, <laughs> the opposite of angel share in whiskey houses, warehouses happens, right? So uh, sherry is not a highly alcoholic spirit, right? So it's not evaporating at the same rate. That's something that is 40% alcohol or, or more is evaporating at. And what's actually evaporating quicker is water. So over time, you get a concentration of alcohol, a concentration of the sherry and less water. And you get things like dry extracts, which is why a lot of older sherries are really thick in the mouth and and if they're super, super old, they're so bitter. And a lot of times that's also why they'll blend in sweeter cherries to sort of balance it out. So those are two situations that in terms of regulation of what happens to alcohol, they, they make adjustments for. Uh, did I answer the question? I think I answered No, that's awesome. it's great. And I think you, you gave people like a, like floor is the ultimate Goldilocks. So, you know, in Spanish, they'll say that like at 14% and below alcohol, the floor faints. So it, like it will, it doesn't have enough to consume. It kind of dies off and invites all sorts of like, you know, the kind of microbiological actors you don't want to invent. But then, you know, at 17, you know, it, 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 you know, kind of falls off too. So it has this really narrow band. And the fact that in this small corner of the world, they've been able to cultivate it. It's just this like minor, like minor miracle. Yeah. It's like, what, we had 3,000 years of history, a whole bunch of time for them to sort of figure out what to do and how to keep things working and how yeah, it was always, the most natural ways. <laughs> it's always, like, culturally, it's always fascinating to me, like what, you know, individual cultures spend their time on. And I'm grateful that, you know, <laughs> someone spent their time on, you know, this like thin veil of yeast on, you know, this, you know, wacky wine from a particular grape. Uh, what else you guys have? Um, that's about it, but I did get you a parting gift, and I think um, it would be much more appreciated um, if it is shared, so I'm going to awkwardly pounce and then pounce back. Okay. Do I need to put on my mask? Yeah. All right. Here we go. <laughs> um, so you all should know that, uh, um, you know, whatever um, strengths or weaknesses I have uh, as an employer, um, you know, one of uh, the least enviable um, reasons to work with me is that I do not fetishize wine keys. So there are some ways that spend, you know, hundreds, if not, you know, four figures on a wine key and I treat wine keys like cheap sunglasses, which is to say I leave them all over the restaurant. I lose them to the extent that I don't even really like have one on me regularly. Um, and so I'm notorious for throughout service, um, asking servers for their wine keys. Uh, naturally, um, you know, I, I imagine like uh, uh, upon a uh, request, Zoe has given me uh, the gift of a takeout container full of wine keys uh, uh, emblazoned with uh, individual, um, <laughs> I imagine, uh, individual um, <laughs> uh, turns of phrase um, derived from both my tasting notes and uh, derived from um, class as, as such. I, I feel like I should, I should read these, but I also want to invite uh, the 75 plus people uh, to tune out now uh, because maybe this will be like a, a Bob Ross style um, uh, play us out uh, kind of moment. Uh, Chantal, uh, thank you so much again uh, for joining us. You fucking rock. 
Um, yeah, this was, this was awesome. Uh, thank you all at home uh, for capping your holiday weekend uh, with us. Zoe, uh, we love you. Thank you so much for the gift. Um, I'm just going to read these out. Uh, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna play it out uh, with a reading of the wine keys. So I'll do. Kick it, Kermit. Riesling band camp. Absorbing the soil. Oh, I'm sorry. Absorbing the soul of the skins. Uh, never 86, the whimsy. Oh, I like that one. Glue, glue, of course. Um, if loving it is wrong, I don't. There's got to be, uh, there's got to be a, a follow-up, want to be right, but uh, uh, let's not kill the lily here. Oh, that's a good one. Um, uh, philosophical beef with the court, which was vindicated, it should be said. Um, everyone knew uh, the court was full of a bunch of smarmy assholes, and um, now there's, there's additional evidence. Uh, raging acid uh, pulling a thread. Champagne flutes are bogus. They, they absolutely are. Um, dancing to architecture, uh, big up to Frank Zappa for that one. Uh, one of life's great joys. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, all Riesling all the time, cartoonishly beautiful. Wine unicorn, kick-ass female winemaker. Let it be known. And of course, closing out uh, for everyone, uh, rally the troops. Excellent question. Salud.